Operative Imaging and Carriage Surgery, important adjuncts and unnecessary expenses, and I'll be a referee if there's any fighting between the Oxford contingent. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, the first speaker is Professor Taggart uh, for the role of graft evaluation quality assurance in CABG surgery. Thank you very much. I think Syed's going to present for him. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say I'm, I've got a little bit more hair than Prof um, <laughs> and less experience. Um, I'm, I'm Moby Rahman. Uh, I'm a registrar in cardiothoracic surgery at the John Macleod Hospital in Oxford. Um, and I'd like to thank Professor Taggart for giving me the opportunity to open this session uh, on intraoperative imaging and cabbage surgery. Uh, and I'm going to talk to you about the, the techniques that are uh, in use. Sorry, uh, how do I go to the next slide? Thanks. So this is an overview of what I'll be talking about. There are um, predominantly two techniques for imaging grass <coughs> effectively, uh, which are transit time flowmetry and intraoperative fluorescence imaging, which I'll refer to as TTFM and IFI. And by describing these in more detail along with the evidence behind them, I hope to address the key question of this session, which is, are they an important adjunct or an unnecessary expense? Now, technical error is certainly a contributing factor to immediate graft failure during uh, bypass graft surgery. And therefore, being able to identify this gives us the opportunity to correct such grafts uh, before the patient leaves theatre. And this is important because the intraoperative graft failure rate has been described as 4%, with the rate of discharge from hospital being 5 to 20%. And this does have serious consequences for the patients, obviously, um, including uh, myocardial infarction, mortality, and a poor long-term outcome. This table here summarizes the techniques that are available for assessing grafts. And as we all know, conventional angiography is the gold <coughs> standard for assessing graft patency. But its use, routine use in, in, in theater is, is not really very practical. Um, and that's mainly because of resource implications, um, including facilities, personnel, cost, and time. Um, and there's also the risk of it being an invasive procedure and requiring the use of uh, nephrotoxic intravenous contrast. The other techniques um, which are not highlighted, electromagnetic flowmetry, thermal angiography, Doppler velocity measurements, and epicardial color Doppler scanning have not been shown to be reliable tools for assessing graft patency, and therefore are not currently in use. And the two that are currently in use that are shown to be reliable and practical are TTFM and IFI. These uh, images here show IFI in action, and IFI uses endocyanin green dye which, when injected into the bloodstream, immediately binds to plasma proteins, and it emits light when it's illuminated by a near-infrared light source. And this fluorescence can be captured on a video camera that gives you real-time videos similar to conventional angiography. And here in, this, uh, in the picture on the left, you can see a right internal thoracic artery graft to an LAD with a composite radial graft to an obtuse marginal. And as you can see, the fluorescence in the um, distal graft is absent. So as a result of this, the proximal anastomosis of the radial graft was revised, and the picture on the right shows fluorescence in the distal reta graft and the LAD. Now, IFI does have some limitations um, in that the transit time for the dye through the circulation um, does depend on several factors, and this includes systemic arterial pressure, hematocrit, uh, conduit diameter, and resistance in the distal uh, coronary vascular bed, and um, competitive flow in the target uh, vessel. Um, therefore, if IFI suggests that there's poor flow in a graft, it may not be immediately obvious exactly what the cause is for that. If competitive flow is suspected to be the cause, then that can be excluded by applying a silastic sling to the proximal target vessel. In addition to that, um, due to limited tissue penetration of uh, IFI and uh, the technique which involves imaging anastomoses from directly above, um, it's not able to give a completely precise 
um, definition of anastomotic quality. And furthermore, it, it does not allow visualization of the complete length of grafts to the circumflex territory and the posterior descending artery. Um, TTFM is based on the principle of transit time ultrasound technology. And you can see a probe there uh, around the graft. That holds the graft perpendicular to two ultrasonic transducers and an acoustic reflector. And the transducers submit ultrasound signals that propagate upstream and downstream um, to the flow through the graft through the reflector. And this is then used to calculate some measurements. This um, is a printout of the results uh, from uh, a TTFM assessment. And the key um, measurements that are, that are made are the mean graph flow in mils per minute on the top left, which is 96 on the top. The diastolic index, which is the proportion of flow through the graft in diastole, and should be more than 50%, as, as you would expect. And the pulsatility index. And, and that's an indicator of resistance to flow through the graft. And a pulsatility index of greater than five uh, is usually indicative of poor flow through the graft. If we look at the, the literature um, for IFI, in summary, we can see that in 690 patients undergoing more than 2,100 uh, bypass grafts, abnormal findings at uh, IFI led to revision of 1.6% of grafts, affecting 3.5% of patients. There's considerably more data published on TTFM, and so this table uh, shows studies with patients of at least uh, studies with at least 100 patients, and um, in summary, at the bottom you can see that in almost 2,500 patients undergoing more than 6,800 grafts, TTFM allowed us to revise 5.4% uh, of patients' grafts, which was 2.1% of grafts. I'm going to focus on the the Kiesa paper from Calgary in 2010. Um, because it, it is quoted in the National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence guidelines on, on TTFM. And this was a prospective study of uh, more than 300 patients receiving almost 1,000 predominantly arterial grafts. And um, as a result of abnormal TTFM findings, uh, 20 grafts or 2% of the grafts were, were revised. And uh, they performed a subgroup analysis of patients that had at least one graft with a pulsatility index less than or equal to five, which suggests good flow, and patients with a pulsatility index greater than five or poor flow. Major adverse cardiac events um, occurred in a significantly greater proportion of patients with poor flow on TTFM, uh, suggested by the, the pulsatility index, compared to um, good flow. Mortality following non-emergent surgery um, in such patients was higher in those with a high pulsatility index. They did show, though, that flow and diastolic index were not predictive. There are three studies that have compared um, IFI and TTFM, two of which are randomized. The first study in 2005 by Professor Group um, looked at 266 grafts in 100 patients and found that 3% of grafts in 8% of patients required revision and that TTFM was falsely positive for graft failure in 10% of patients. That is obviously that an abnormal finding of TTFM didn't necessarily relate to a poorly functioning graph. Desai and colleagues in 2006 published a randomized study looking at 106 patients with 139 graphs, and they found that IFI was more sensitive than TTFM and overall more accurate um, to detect graph stenosis of more than 50% or occluded graphs in, intraoperatively. The, the GRIP trial by uh, Dr. Freem's group in, in, in Toronto was published in 2010. This again was randomized and looked at uh, 156 patients receiving 467 grafts. They only had three revisions and they showed that the major adverse cardiac events at one year were identical in both patients being imaged interoperatively and those that were not imaged. And also occlusion at angiography at one year was not significantly different between the two groups. And therefore, they concluded that routine interoperative graph assessment is safe, but it doesn't lead to a marked reduction. Now, the Nas National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence, for any of you who don't know, 
issues uh, guidelines for medical practice in, in the UK. And um, it uh, published those uh, for TTFM in, in 2011. And they supported routine use of, of TTFM for interoperative graft assessment, um, as it may reduce the incidence of occlusion, morbidity, and mortality. There were guidelines published on uh, interoperative fluorescence imaging in 2004, and although they did suggest that it was safe for use, um, the evidence suggesting its effectiveness was limited, and it is due for review. NICE did um, do a sort of a cost analysis on, on TTFM, although there aren't actually any formal economic evaluations uh, with randomized patients, so look at this. But they found that if TTFM is used routinely, it results in 115 pounds. Sorry to interrupt saving. you, you've got 90 seconds to wrap it up. Thank you. So it showed 115 pound cost saving per patient, taking account all those factors listed there. And although there's no economic evaluation of IFI, it showed that its use uh, is, uh, works out at 175 to 300 pounds per patient. So I hope that by providing you with the evidence um, on these imaging modalities, I can help to address the question of whether it's an important adjunct or an unnecessary expense. Thank you. So we're going to hold up the questions on that for the uh, so Steve Westerby who's going to come up now and, and talk to us about uh, anastomotic probing. It allows adequate evaluation of graft patency and then the talk following that will have the questions. Divide the ses this session into two effective sessions. Steve, 10 minutes. Yeah, 12. Where's the... Um what have we done with the thing to change the slides? Oh, I see it. You... That's a minute gone. <laughs> um, next. What a poison chalice uh, been asked to talk against technology, and I have two talks talking against technology in this uh, session. Uh, but, of course, having been around for 30 years in cardiac surgery, most of this technology didn't exist, so was I doing a worse job before the technology came? Uh, uh, I don't know. We, maybe we'll see. But I thought this was a great quote to start with. Anecdotal reports from senior cardiothoracic surgeons like me in both academic and community hospitals suggest that in the absence of concomitant ECG or hemodynamic problems, insertion of a probe through a, a partially completed distal anastomosis is the commonest objective assessment of technical adequacy. Well, I've had 30 years of sticking my probe all over the place, and I, I tell you, it, it, it's, it's not a bad way of doing things. Shall I set the stage, uh, uh, as my colleague David was meant to do, what are the consequences of bypass graft occlusion? Well, we all know, because we've all had it, and you do a rotten graft or a rotten vessel, and at the end, uh, you've got ventricular dysfunction, uh, ventricular dysrhythmias, hemodynamic instability, the balloon goes in and the patient eventually dies. Not necessarily the concept of graft occlusion. Uh, these complications require all sorts of maneuver and prolonged intensive care, and the economic consequences are quite considerable. What's the extent of the problem? 22,500 isolated cabbage operations per year in myocardial infarction in 9% of the patients. 9% of the patients have an infarct, but as we've just heard, less than 2% actually have occluded graphs. So there are other things, uh, apart from just graft occlusion, that are contributing to perioperative myocardial infarction. Intraoperative graft occlusion is said to occur in 4% of grafts and 8% of patients, and graft failure by hospital discharge affects 5% to 20% of the patients. And indeed, the PREVENT-4 trial showed 30% of vein grafts to fail within a year, and that, that's an appalling attrition. Now, what are the causes of graft failure? Well, what we're talking about today is technically get it right. Uh, and I tell you, it doesn't matter how much experience you have, there are still technical issues that you can uh, experience uh, even after thousands and thousands of operations. 
technical problems, but if you've got a diffusely atheromatous vessel with a vein graft and poor runoff, that may occlude your, your, your graft very quickly. Competitive flow may occlude uh, even an arterial uh, graft if you do your graft to a borderline obstruction in a coronary. And certain prothrombotic environments can promote graft closure, and that was the aprotonin story. Um, I actually started the aprotonin story in the early 1980s, and I have to say I'm very, very, very disappointed that aprotonin isn't widely available in the UK now. It was a very good thing. What technical issues cause graft occlusion? Well, you know, you can pick up the back wall of a small coronary artery uh, if you're not concentrating extremely carefully. You can purse string the narrowing of a conduit inflow. Before the anastomosis, you can injure your uh, conduit, and that's why many years ago I started surgical care practitioners, and the very first one, Suzanne Holmes, is sat in the audience. If the person taking your conduit uh, does a poor job, then endothelial damage can result in early graft occlusion. You can kink vein grafts if they're too long, and you can dissect an internal thoracic artery if you inject papaverine and other things like that into it. But if you're a man with big glasses, then these technical issues uh, are not frequent. So what are the simple methods to assess anastomotic patency? Well, I'm here to talk about the probe. Thanks for asking me to talk about a probe. <laughs> One, <laughs> once, you've, once you've put in your anastomosis, you can uh, <coughs> infuse through a vein graft and see if the runoff is good. Your ECG sometimes, sometimes, but not always, will tell you whether you've got a problem. Uh, and if you have got a problem, then you can go to the cath lab to sort it out. And I'm a great protagonist of getting to the cath lab early if you're running into problems. That is same afternoon. So here we are, the probe and runoff test. There's an anastomosis, vein graft to the right coronary, in goes the famous probe, uh, probably 35 years old, that probe, but that's the best Oxford could do. And then infuse uh, a little um, heparinized blood and see how it feels, my, or my career. Um, and um, I've never uh, been able to play with the, uh, the, the, the fancy imaging gear, but I'll get round to that uh, in a while. Can you go wrong? Well, yes, you can. And this is a patient of mine from just literally a few weeks ago. Uh, Lee, internal thoracic artery to the LAD. I probed it. There was excellent runoff so that the uh, territory flash filled and was innovated by the runoff from that lemma graph straight away. Uh, and then something happened because there were ST segment changes when the patient went back to you and I said, what's, what's going on here? Because I saw the runoff. Now, that liter had been tacked down to prevent it being pulled off. And quite simply, all that had happened was a tacking stitch had pulled the liter anastomosis one way and virtually occluded it. So the patient went back to theater, the tacking stitch was removed, the territory flash filled again, uh, and everything was fine. But that is a very important illustration that even when you're certain, might not have done. So, as you've just heard, we have many ways now of quality control. Uh, here's just a few papers. Uh, there's one of David's. He's very keen on the imaging business. Uh, it can be expensive, uh, but uh, here's Wolf again. I started with Wolf to ensure our patient's safety as well as improve the long-term outlook of revascularization, there needs to be continued critical evaluation uh, of the graft patency. And just, just uh, to end this, I was on the NICE committee, the only cardiac surgeon on the NICE committee that put the uh, very Q system uh, through for guidelines. Uh, NICE is a very strange body. It's mostly people that know nothing about what they're actually looking at. And I've, I've been involved in all sorts of hormone treatments and breast imaging and everything else with NICE. We don't need to know uh, about your personal was, life, Steve. Sorry. How many seconds have I got? No, we don't need to know about your personal life. <laughs> I was just getting round to that, Andy. 
<laughs> you've spoiled it for everybody now. <laughs> so look, we now have NICE who say that everyone should be imaging their uh, graphs at the end of cardiopulmonary bypass. Put your hands up if you've got a very Q system. Absolutely nobody has got a very Q system except that gentleman over there. So what is happening in the NHS is NICE is producing guidelines that the NHS can't afford. It's the same in mechanical circulatory support. It's the same all over the place. And we just have to put our foot down. If NICE say we're entitled to this, you ask for it and you should be able to get it. Um, do I still stick to my probe? My probe is all I've got at the moment, so I keep sticking my probe in everything I can stick it into, and it's worked for me so far. But at, at least I've washed my dirty washing in public. I've shown you graft occlusion interoperative, and uh, I don't want to make light of all this. Quality assurance is important because it reflects on mortality and morbidity, uh, and we all need to get with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you very much for that excellent presentation. So we'll try and come back to some science and uh, Professor Haverstadt. Uh, <laughs> um, will tell us about evaluation of graph patents. <coughs> My turn. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the invitation. I will continue on the same topic, uh, speaking about graph patency with uh, different aspects. I do have a very QC, actually, but I'm not li living in this country. And we have been there before, and now we are back for a couple of days but we become, become much softer. And you also come to us nicely with your pounds. My disclosures is uh, some connection with Medistim, but uh, this is a no fee presentation and it's not a Medistim talk. The practical issues have been touched. Uh, there could be different kinds of technical failures during cardiac surgery, Technical uh, graph failures in the anastomosis, in the, in the graph conduit, approximately distally, dissected lima, and as well competitive flow. Although the anastomosis may be perfect. The methods have been mentioned. I will not go more into details of uh, most of it unless um, uh, the uh, and the epicardial imaging will be more thoroughly discussed. Angiography, just to mention that in, in Japan, most patients having, do have an angio before discharge, for different reasons, but I don't think that's a practice we should uh, take on. This has been mentioned. What is important to when you assess the transit time flow me measurement, which uh, we do routinely in my institution, we do it in all cases. Uh, you have to know how to assess, you have to know how to uh, evaluate, and know what's a good and what's a bad anastomosis. But it's not that easy, after all. What's most important is looking at the lima, it should be a good diastolic flow. The vein graft has more of a dual pattern. But there is no minimum of mean flow. No minimum X unless it's above zero. So there is no real threshold unless it's zero. And that's a problem. But no, no, nevertheless, in our institution, uh, we do assess uh, graft verification as a part of surgery. It's not additional, it's a part of it. And everybody has to do it and put it in their database. 
And we had to think of that pulse is not the same as flow. There could be pulse with the occluded distal anastomosis. ECG may be normal, and, and this is a very severe LAD problem. The myocardium is very subjective. There are good flows and poor flows, but it's not that easy in practice. What I will give you some more insight into is, is uh, try to defer the stenosis of the anastomosis and competitive, competitive flow. We made an animal study looking at this. We know from clinical studies that you should have more than 50 to even 75% stenosis and until uh, flow measurements are reduced. So it can be far from perfect, despite the flow is, seems to be good. We compared in an animal study these two situations. We looked at baseline flow with occluded, uh, with delimiter LED, with occluded uh, native uh, artery. We had a pat fully patent uh, LID and a patent anastomosis. We had a competitive flow, partial competitive flow in the LID, and we had a dis distal anastomosis in the toe, the distal stenosis in the toe of the anastomosis. About 75% assessed with epicardial imaging. The main results were that the mean graph flow were more reduced by competitive flow than with the stenosis of the, of the anastomosis. Diastolic flow was more affected by competitive flow. And the PI was uh, similar in those two situations, but with full flow, it's, it's a high PI. We presented this in the European Journal, 2009. So 75% stenosis is necessary to get uh, impaired graph flow. And glioma graph flow was significantly, significantly, uh, significantly reduced by competitive flow, particularly the diastolic flow. So it's not that easy to separate stenosis or anastomosis and competitive flow. You have to look at the details, particularly the diastolic flow. This is a very normal Lima to LED flow curve, very nice, very simple uh, diagram. Look at the details, you have to assess the uh, uh, diastolic flow with ECG measurements simultaneously. This is an occlud occluded lima. There is no diastolic flow, and uh, there is close to zero mean flow, and a very high PI. This should definitely be revised. This is normal uh, vein graph to uh, right coronary flow. Uh, obviously, a good, probably an obviously good graph, but in the end, it should be 75% stenosis and. Uh, there could be a 75% stenosis, close to zero flow. This should definitely be revised. This is a nice uh, vein graph to the circumflex, low PI. This is with a kink in the vein graph to the right side, high PI, which is very sensitive to a graft problem. The PI is very sensitive and it's higher than at least 10. And here's a flap in the uh, right uh, graft. There are disadvantages and advantages with um, transit time flow. The problem with the uh, transit time flow, it's functionality, no morphology. There's not, no anatomical assessment. This made m myself to go further with the epicardial ultrasound, and some of this was uh, post-processed and uh, wrote, wrote up when I worked in the Cardiff many years ago. And found that epicardial ultrasound had a good correlation with angiography. But you have to make a schematic 
pre presentation of an anastomosis to be able to make papers of this, like this. And it's very simple to perform, particularly in off cases with a stabilizer. Just do the grafting and put the probe upon the distal anastomosis. Everybody can do this very easily, like this. And when you see anastomosis morphologically like this, you can feel very confident this is a good anastomosis. And combined with a good flow, you should be very uh, confident with the results. With this one, there is uh, stenosis in the distal part of the uh, anastomosis. This is not that satisfactory. Probably it should be revised. And when you see it like this, it's a flap in the toe of the stenosis. This should definitely be revised. Because you can see what's the problem. We have made several papers on this uh, topic. Also, subclavian steel syndrome can be visualized with the uh, epicardial ultrasound because you can see the flow is turning the wrong direction. So my current practice is using the very QC. First, we check the flow. We look at the uh, uh, Lima to LID flow before I remove the clamp in on-pump cases. There is no collateral flow at that. Point. Then we look at, after weaning off bypass, we look at the diastolic filling pattern, we look at mean flow, it should at least be uh, about 10, but there is no evidence really for this. PI should be below 5. The evidence is reasonably good. In, if you use transonic, it should be below 3 because there are different settings in the two units. And we also check with and without papaverin in uh, vein grafts. In, um, uh, in uh, on pump cases, if we do epical imaging, which I don't do routinely, but I do it sometimes, then I use a stabilizer, like in uh, off pump cases. Otherwise, it's quite difficult. And we can get a very good image and being confident when you see this. This is a Lima to LID and symbol system. The Lima is coming on the top right LID to the left. So the conclusion, coronary graft assessment is in my view valuable. TTFM is simple and a good method, but it's not the uh, final. Uh, you can make, you cannot always, not always make a final decision, but it's an adjunct. Epical ultrasound gives a morphological impression uh, of the anastomosis and grafts. May differentiate between an uh, open uh, lima or a dissected lima, for instance. You can also look at the proximal side. So they two are, may work very well together, particularly in often cases. I, and they, with this method, you can visualize graft papers. Thank you. Well, th thank you very much. That's left us about five minutes for questions in this session before we move on to the second half. So if anyone's got a question, could you please stand up, take the microphone, just briefly identify yourself and fire on. Hi, um, Amal Bose from uh, Blackpool. Um, Quintus, um, how long does this add to a routine case to image using the modalities mentioned? What did you say? I, I how long does it take to do the imaging. The, the, the standard three vessels. Very simple, actually. It's uh, if you need a stab stable area, either with a stabilizer or you have to hold the heart in your hand. You need uh, you need uh, some gel, sterile gel. But uh, other than that, it's very simple. It's easy to learn, and it's just as easy to learn, in my view, <coughs> as uh, doing uh, flow measurement. 
and it's more uh, visual for the surgeon. So the problem is uh, the cost of the unit is a double price compared to a standard uh, TTFM unit. And you can't do obtuse marginal and right coronary artery imaging. Is, is, is it possible to do right coronary artery imaging and obtuse marginal? You margin? can with the stabilizer, yeah. yeah. Dave? D David Jenkins, Papworth. Um, this is really a question to the panel and, and the speakers. Um, I think we all accept that graft patency is important and that our graft should be patent at the end of the operation. But my worry with all this intraoperative imaging is we exclude what happens when the chest's closed. And really, if it's important, don't we need some imaging modality that looks at the grafts when the operation's finished, when the chest is closed? Because I think, as Steve Westby eloquently illustrated, it's not just the anastomosis that's important. And aren't we missing a big chunk of the problem if we're just looking at the flow when, when the chest is opened and we've just done the anastomosis? So I'd like to ask all the panel, what, what, what do they think? I, I, uh, I 100 percent agree with, with what you say, and I was very impressed by the presentation just now that showed with a very cube system, you could have a 75 percent narrowing of an anastomosis without, without picking up a serious problem. Uh, I can tell you for sure, if NICE were aware of that when they, when they looked at very cube, they, they would have discussed it very carefully. Um, in reality, uh, you're right, and, and some people, uh, as we just heard, the, the Japanese actually do angiography post-operatively, and non-invasive uh, angiography uh, is certainly possible and so on, but who is going to pay for that in the UK? And we're at a profound disadvantage with all these uh, highly technological systems in that cost rules it out for most hospitals. Maybe, maybe we can get some words from David as well. I mean, the just I mean, I mean, I personally think it's an absolute disgrace our 20% one-year vein graft uh, occlusion rate. I mean, this is what cardiologists show us all the time. They say these are, these are worse than stents. I mean, I think this is the elephant in the room in cardiac surgery. It's a it's a disgrace we need to fix. How can we rectify this? Yeah, I mean, I think the problem is there are actually no easy ways of doing this. Because all of the technologies are imperfect. And for example, we, when we did a prospective comparison of TTFM with the intrafluorescence imaging system, we found that if we'd just simply gone by the TTFM measurements, we would have had to revise 8% of our graphs on the numbers we had. <coughs> Excuse me, but when we confirmed by in, in, intrafluorescence imaging, they looked okay and we left them. The problem when you close the chest is a is a rather um, consideration, and, and there's no easy answer to that. But uh, I think one of the reasons I'm keen on imaging is for, I try to use two internal mammary arteries on most of my patients. And if the patient leaves the operating room, I mean, if you've got a blocked vein graft to a fourth obtuse marginal, it's a nuisance, but it's not actually terribly important in reality. But if your patient's leaving the operating room with one or other of the mammaries not patent, that is a major problem. And to be able to revise them you know, at the end of the operation is the right time to do it because you know, that's the one maneuver we do during coronary bypass grafting that actually impacts materially on the patient's longevity. So if you do nothing else but make sure your patient leaves the operating room with a patent mammary artery, I think it's important. Do you have one more question? Thanks. Just a simple Thank question, you. really, for the people who are doing it. Have you seen any improvement in your results after starting doing this uh, sort of measurements? Uh, you, mean, you mean the epicardial imaging? Yes. Yeah. I don't do it in that big number because uh, uh, I bought it somehow <coughs> a year ago. I use it for the research. Uh, I'm a bit afraid of the pro being uh, um, being injured, so I don't use it every day. But uh, I, I use it more for looking at the uh, 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 at the aorta. Yeah. 
than uh, on the diesel and ethanol buses. But when I now rarely do off pump, I use it every time. But for on pump, I don't use it every time. So I cannot uh, okay, answer your we're question. We're coming to the auto shortly. So could just one last question up there. If you want to stand up and shout it out. In theatre, if you can see that a graft is not patent or is not widely patent, it's worth revising it. And if you come out of theatre and a patient does un isn't doing well and you angiogram them and they're not doing well, then you could go back in and regraft or stent or do something. But if we're imaging everyone with angiography and a patient's doing well and one of the vein grafts is not got ideal flow, what are we going to do differently? Are we going to go back in and reoperate on them, subject them to another operation? or just watch? Just a question. Dave? <coughs> well, using, it depends which system you're using. If you're using the poor FCC system, which I was doing good draft for, you go into that kind of work, I said yes or no with that. But what we find with the TTFM was, it was much more, as Rooney really said, it's much more nuanced in how you interpret that in about 10% of patients. So one system's easy, so with the fluorescence, it's blocked or it's not blocked. The TTFM system raises different questions. Well, well, clearly you're not going to take a patient back to theatre with a blocked vein graft if they're hemodynamically well. You maybe try putting a stent, I guess. Because I think the package of how they tried to sell it was you had to pay upfront costs for the machine, which was pretty expensive. And then the dye itself is quite cheap. It's about £50 per time, but I think it's got quite large <coughs> set-up set costs. Well, thanks for that. That's a great session. Everybody's kind of kept the time. We're going to move on to the second half of the show. Thank you very much. Could I just very briefly ask Steve? You can't, that's right. You can't sit down and give the microphone off. <laughs> Thank you very much. Steve, so, can so I do an investigation of probes? <laughs> Thank you. So the podium is taken again by Professor Hammerstad. We will talk about the recognition of potential interoperative pitfall, the AP aortic uh, interrogation of the ascending aorta during CABG surgery. Thank you very much once again. So uh, actually, uh, I do um, use the equipment more for this purpose, uh, as I don't, I, I myself do more, more valves and aortic than the coronary at the moment. This is for me a very challenging title, uh, and uh, I don't know whether it's possible to answer it properly, but we will see. And still, this is no medicine talk, and no pay for it. We do have a focus on aortic pathology, and we all know a lot of the deceased uh, patients with uh, calcified aortas, and we also know the devastating uh, effects of uh, uh, atheromatosis in the aorta, the stroke. <coughs> and uh, very poor uh, events. There, there's a lot of evidence regarding epidemiology, the risk. We also know from the, uh, from the Syntex trial, uh, cabbage versus PCI shows more uh, stroke in the uh, surgery cohort, which uh, for uh, the first year was very much against surgery, but by the time and until five years results, we see more problem with the PCI cohort. So we have really come back here to uh, something uh, good for surgeons. But still, uh, stroke is a problem for cardiac surgery. And with valves, there is even a more severe problem. And we, can, we are able to rest our surgery if we know there is a bump in the aorta. Leipzig has analyzed this in a big number of patients. 
and uh, call to that identification of the problem may improve the results, which is, of course, uh, true. But there may also be non-atromatous uh, emboli. So it's not only the problem with the, uh, what we can see on CET or uh, ultrasound. There may also, may also be gas cells emboli. There are, by time, a lot of evidence, but more regarding the problem, not, always, not the solution. I won't go through everything of this. But CT is less sensitive than the AP optic ultrasound in the de detecting atromatous plaques in the ascending aorta. And the reason for this is that there is a lot of soft atroma in the aorta. If you see this on the left, before surgery, we will obviously not go ahead we are doing a routine surgery. We may, in a cupboard, do it off pump or uh, we may advocate for a PCI or something. But quite often we don't have that I image before or CT before surgery. When, and when it's like this, we should be able to see it on an angiogram or even on a chest x-ray. But most, very, very often, it's much less calcified than this. And we have the uh, best evidence topic from yourself uh, many years ago, looking at the benefit of epiotic ultrasound, uh, quoting that uh, epiotic ultrasound is much more, it should be much more beneficial than uh, just palpation on the ascending order. We uh, investigated this a bit further re regarding uh, the comparison between uh, TOE and uh, epiotic ultrasound. As uh, many would say that when we do a TOE in patients, that's enough. And may, and may be uh, comparable with uh, epiotic ultrasound. We presented uh, this study in 2008, and uh, part of this was actually done in Cardiff. See, Alan Fraser is on the list. The, the uh, objectives were, were, were to um, look at the grading of atroma and also compare TOE with the epiotic ultrasound. We separated the aorta into 12 areas, like this. We used a uh, GE probe at that time. We looked at 60 patients. It's not a lot, but we did get some results. And there, there are different grading scales for, uh, for uh, atromas, and we modified it slightly. The, the main twin of atroma of five mil, five, uh, four millimeter thickness compared to those below. If it's ulcerated or vegetated, it's even worse. This is a typical grade four. What we found was that the AP aortic ultrasound could see many more of, the, of these areas. We could scan a larger proportion of the aorta. We could also, we could also de, uh, <coughs> find more diseased segments. And the more distally in the aorta, the more could be uh, seen detected with AP aortic ultrasound. TOE is very poor distal in the aorta. Same with the uh, uh, transthoracic ultrasound. It's very poor on the distal half. Approximately, TOE is good. We don't uh, cannulate there. We don't put a clamp there. So we, the, uh, our conclusion was that the apiotic ultrasound is the intraoperative investigation of choice because it allows a detailed grading of atromatous lesions over the entire length of the ascending order. There is a, not a lot of studies regarding uh, surgical uh, adjustments. I have uh, had some co collaboration with Dr. Kamler in Essen. He made a study looking at the surgical consequences. 129 patients looking at those sites with the main interest for the surgeon. And he had a standardized scanning process. Uh, very few of these could, uh, were, were uh, suspected from the angiogram. 10%. There were different kinds of procedures, cabbages and valves and everything. 
He looked at the cannulation site. He looked at the cannula positioning, cross clamp site. He looked at what he, could, he had to modify. He modified in more than 20% of the cases, and for patient detected the problems in less than 40% of the cases. The outcome, still the outcome, were stroke in a few cases. So you can never, never be sure. So my practice now is looking at this, uh, at the, uh, the complete ascending aorta with the uh, epiotic ultrasound using the very QC. When uh, Sometimes we can really see a severe atroma. Sometimes we, have, we are suspicious from uh, angiogram, chest x-ray, or CD. But you can always see more with the epiotic ultrasound. It, this is very simple, just to put the, uh, the uh, problem. And uh, it, it's a very good resolution of the equipment. It's very easy to see, like here. can be terrible. What you see in ultrasound is even worse when you see it directly. And speaking about cabbage, a lot of our cases now are combined valves and cabbage. One adjustment you can do, I'm not talking about surgery here, but just uh, I had one case, I did the endoclamp in, in, in a valve recently, and uh, this can also be done with, uh, with uh, combined with the cabbage. To, to use an uh, endoclamp with a balloon inside the ascending aorta is very efficient. Just wanted to show you that picture. My conclusion is that aortic palpation gives poor judgment. pre op CD is less sensitive than the uh, AP aortic ultrasound and the epileptic ultrasound is better than TOE. And it's, epileptic ultrasound is safe, easy, and very fast to perform. And you can see uh, plaques and wall thickenings, and uh, you may be able to uh, adjust your uh, strategy. But clinically, we don't know, because there are no randomized studies, and those have to be very big. I think for the future, in ideal world, you are integrated in intraoperative assessment, looking at the aorta, doing flow measurements, doing imaging of the anastomosis and grafts. It's costly, but it may be efficient. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to invite Steve back up uh, to talk about intraoperative palpation of the aorta uh, yields adequate information. <laughs> And nothing. <laughs> no, nothing, nothing it about is nice and hormones of your mind. Talk. <laughs> it's a very, very good talk. <laughs> some, of, some of you. Uh, oh no, go back. I wanted a pointer, but I'm, some of you in the room may recognise these fingers, and, and that is the aorta between my fingers. And my unenviable task today is to refute the first talk and say that the fingers are the best. Well, here we go. <laughs> I think I'll stay on this light-hearted vein because I know when I'm on a hide into nothing. So here is a scan, an MRI scan, of cerebral injury secondary to aortic clamping. Uh, I'd forgotten I'd put that title on the slide because what I did want to say is here is one of David Taggart's off-pump cases <laughs> with, with multiple cerebral infarcts afterwards, but I kind of spoilt it. This is what we're talking about. This is what we're trying to avoid when we're talking about handling the aorta. Uh, what is the extent of the problem? Well, <clears throat> I found this in the New England Journal of Medicine, um, and uh, it's always good to quote the New England Journal of Medicine. So here's a study comparing off-pump and on-pump coronary surgery at 30 days, uh, and um, it's a very important uh, study, uh, you see one of the co-authors is David Taggart, and stroke, the bottom line, off-pump and on-pump in a huge series of patients, exactly the same. 
If you look at the hazard ratio for stroke, needless to say, uh, it increases with age. The older you get, the more likely you are to have a stroke. Now, the inference, of course, always is that the stroke arises from the aorta and that uh, uh, a no-touch technique on the aorta uh, can prevent stroke. But again, I would refute that it's that simple. I have to say that if, if you use uh, a cranial Doppler uh, and handle the aorta and look at the cranial Doppler when you put the aortic cannula in and so on and so forth, uh, it's very frightening. But it is when you do a valve replacement and see all the micro bubbles of air that go uh, to the head as well. Uh, the a question is, what is the extent of the clinical importance? Because if, if you wanted NICE to approve the EPIC aortic scanner, um, EPI, not EPIC, the EPI aortic scanner, you, you would have to get NICE to prove, all their economists to prove that you were going to get economic benefit. NICE are literally only interested in economic <coughs> benefit. Um, so we'd have to say that no-touch techniques and so on were going to benefit the patient uh, and that you must look at the aorta with epi aortic scanning uh, if you're going to cannulate the aorta at all. Uh, and now we start to get into a complicated area. If you look at this uh, uh, study, and it, again, an enormous study of 26,000 Spanish patients the perioperative stroke incidence was only 1.3%. And there was no overall difference between on and off pump, uh, and the risk factors uh, were non-elective surgery, peripheral vascular disease, heart failure, prior stroke, and chronic renal failure. You could only demonstrate a difference on and off pump, uh, and that is handling the aorta and not handling the aorta, uh, when you honed down on individual risk factors. What about carotid arteries? Well, as you know, if patients have got severe carotid artery disease, that may be the cause of the stroke that you have and not handling of the aorta. Um, and it's, uh, it's uh, interesting that uh, you get the same incidence of stroke for non-severe carotid artery disease as for severe. So things are not always what they seem. So what is my approach? Uh, I don't have epi-aortic scanning, so I can't use it, and that goes for most of us. So how do I try and avoid uh, stroke in the patients? Well, the first thing is, even with routine coronary angiography and so on, uh, you get clues. Uh, here is uh, an angiogram. The coronary is calcified, but if you look carefully, you can see calcium in the, in the aorta. When I'm assessing any patient for any cardiac operation, I always look for previous speaker very elo eloquently uh, emphasized that point as well. If, uh, uh, certainly for elderly uh, patients, particularly if you see calcium on a plain x-ray or on the angiogram, uh, I advocate a preoperative CT scan so you know what you're dealing with. Uh, rule number one, know what you're dealing with. And the extent of this calcification is a grave problem <coughs> for cross clamping. And if you're going to do coronary bypass grafts with proximal ends, with uh, vein grafts, then as Nick Kachukas advocated way back in the 1980s, you're going to have to resect that aorta. And in the old days with severely calcified aortas, I actually <coughs> used to do hypothermic circulatory arrest, replace the ascending aorta, and put proximal ends on... What else do we have if we don't have epi-aortic scanning? Well, TOE, I think, is very important, uh, and I'm not going to make funny remarks about my lady anesthetist or, or my very excellent uh, echocardiographer, but these findings, uh, uh, the TOE provides excellent information about aortic thickening. And if you've got an expert TOE doctor, which we're fortunate to have in Oxford, he can warn you of where uh, you're going to run into trouble. Now, getting round to what I'm actually meant to be talking about, which is um, sticking your fingers around the aorta to see what it feels like, the educated finger is not 
uh, uh, as big a joke as it sounds. Particularly once you're on bypass and drop the perfusion pressure, you can actually feel plaques and so on. Uh, and before you even go on to bypass, you can feel thickening and plaques in the aorta. And of course, the place where it's very common to have thickening, if you're going to have it, is just proximal to the innominate artery where you're going to put your uh, aortic cannula in. So I invariably, every single cardiac case, do do precisely what you see and assess whether I'm likely to run into a plaque when the aortic cannula goes in. Uh, and I, I, I don't mind going around all the way around to the subclavian artery at the back to find a hole that's not thickened. Uh, and whether or not you put a, an aortic cross clamp on and give cardioplegia, or whether you do it off pump and so on, can uh, depend on, on those findings. And uh, I think one thing to say is, is uh, th these pictures actually show nothing at all. But do <laughs> avoid repeated aortic clamping. Because even if you don't think there's significant atheroma or calcium in the aorta, the more you clamp the aorta, uh, the more you're going to run into trouble. So when, when I was doing proximal ends for coronary bypass grafts like that, I used one light titanium clamp, uh, and I've got beautiful light clamps because I used to do congenital heart surgery, uh, a, a, a lovely light titanium clamp and put it on in such a way that you can do two, two or three top ends with one episode of clamping. Just simple things. Now, if you're going to go to extremes to prevent the 1% cerebral embolism and stroke rate, we saw a few years ago the introduction of particulate filters to prevent stuff going to the brain, and they caught little bits of stuff. There, there are little bits of stuff filters at the bottom, but boy, they just didn't catch on. Uh, they were made available. A few papers were written about them, but I bet none of us in the room use this contraption. And similarly, transcranial Doppler, uh, I think we, we all went through a phase where we wanted to use transcranial Doppler for, used it for uh, clinical work because all it did was tell you that the horse had already bolted. And when you put on a transcranial Doppler, un, under the picture of the girl with the equipment on her head is a TOE which shows numerous particles uh, and you record the numerous particles and then the patient wakes up and is ostensibly completely normal. So what these are telling us is not always uh, uh, of, of significance. So just my summary uh, in terms of simple and my motto throughout my whole career in cardiac surgery was simple is safe. Keep things simple. Uh, predict that you're going to run into a problem by scrutinizing the angiography of every patient or the plain chest x-ray and look for problems ahead of time. Do a preoperative CT scan if there's any doubt at all. Always use transesophageal echocardiography and palpate for aortic thickening. Handling the aorta, well, avoid clamping uh, a diseased aorta. That goes without saying. Take particular care over cannulation. Consider an embolic filter, and none of us will use it. Uh, and for severe atheroma and porcelain aorta, replace the ascending aorta. Use hypothermic circulatory arrest. Don't take risks that result in stroke. Stroke is the most devastating complication of cardiac surgery after death. Uh, it is avoidable. Uh, we don't always have these very fine pieces of equipment to help us, uh, but there's a lot you can do uh, to keep your patients safe uh, without having uh, the, the, that sort of equipment. And of course, I'm not saying it's bad to have that sort of equipment. It's great uh, when you can get it. In the NHS at the moment, we're, we're lucky to get the sutures we want. Thank you very much. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much for keeping to time. James, you've got 10 to 12 minutes. Right. Well, now that we've got confirmation that the uh, ascending aorta is diseased, either by epic aortic scanning or by Professor Westerby's sensitive finger, what do we do about it? Ascending aortic uh, arteriosclerosis is one of the most important risk factors for perioperative stroke. 
And this is the kind of CT scan we do not like to see when we refer to a routine coronary set of coronary artery studies. Is this in the ascending aorta and also classification in the descending thoracic aorta? If you look at the society database in 2008, you can see that the average age of patients that we operate on increases year by year from about 58 years old in 1991 to 67, 66 years old in 2008, and it will continue probably to rise. And also here, it's interesting to note that the number of patients that we operate on, which is over 80 years old, is also increasing uh, year on year, and so is patients over the age of 75. There is very strong uh, evidence to suggest that there is a significant correlation between age and aortic uh, disease. And if you look at this paper published in circulation in 2000 and something, uh, you see that as the average age of the patient increases, the, is, the incidence of unclampable ascending aorta in coronary artery disease uh, uh, bypass patient increases as well. So we're going to face more and more of this problem uh, uh, as a surgeon today. Kuchukos, when you look at his series of 500 consecutive patients, he found that 13.6% of the patients had significant aortic disease. And if you look carefully at your patients, like, like with TOE uh, in this publication in 2007, I'm actually quite surprised that only a third of the patient has no arteroma. The majority of patients has got a degree of disease, either with mild, majority, 50%, we've got very severe arteroma. TOE is a good imaging technique uh, to assess um, aortic disease, but the limitation is that there is a small area in the descending, uh, distal ascending aorta near the innominal artery that is like a, a blind spot. And unfortunately, that's the area that we're likely to place our clamp as a surgeon. CT scan is a, a much better, uh, a very accurate way of assessing the aorta, but for routine set of coronary arteries, I don't think any one of us will order a CT scan just to look at the aorta. So if you know that the aorta is disease preoperatively, then that's slightly simpler because you can then plan your treatment, maybe persuade your cardiologist to, to do a PCI instead, or you plan an operative strategy, and the patient can be fully informed and consented for the procedures. But most of the time, we found out that the aorta is disease at the time of surgery when the chest is open, either through TOE, through a scan, but we don't, have a, we don't really have a scan, and most of us actually rely on uh, manual digital palpation. And it said that we can miss up to 50 to 75% of small and soft arteroma. So this is the patient when the chest is open. You notice that you found out for the first time that this aorta is completely calcified. It will be a big plug from there all the way up into the arch of the aorta. The question then you have to ask yourself is, what do I do? What are the surgical options? Do I abandon the procedures? Well, I'm sure everybody in this room will say, no, I think we should proceed now that we've, now that we've come this far. The second option would be off-pump surgery. And of course, um, if off-pump surgery is possible with all arterial graft without clamping the aorta, then I would say that that's probably the preferred option. But not all of us do off-pump surgery. And if you have not done it before, if not, that's not your routine procedures, then it's probably not the, first time, not the best time to do it for the first time. So you have two options. You either phone a friend, yeah? but if you do not have a friend, then you have to think of alternative strategy. So the other option would be to replace the aorta, under, be aggressive and replace the aorta under circulatory arrest, followed by CEBG. Kuchukos, in his publication, over an 11-year period, he identified 81 patients uh, with significant uh, aortic uh, disease, and he, re he went on and replaced the ascending aorta under circulatory arrest in 75, uh, 75 of his patients. And the mortality, even in good hands, is 8.6%, with a stroke rate of 4.9%. Of course, <coughs> that was from 1998. I'm sure his res uh, the result will have been proved uh, uh, by now. And similarly, uh, from Cleveland Clinic, if you had to replace the AO, ascending aorta under circulatory, circulatory arrest in patients who is having aortic valve replacement, the mortality is actually quite high, 25%. With a more recent series in 2012, Gulu looked at um, that many patients, 
and he found that 36 patients had severe aortic disease and 22% he did under circulatory arrest with a pretty good mortality of 2.8%. But anyway, I mean, if you had to replace the aorta under circulatory arrest, it's actually a very major undertaking, you know, plus a risk of uh, stroke as well. But what about the other option? Just a sim simple single cross clamp technique. Now, if you suggest that to me a few years ago, I will, have been, I, will be in hor I will be horrified because you can imagine when you clamp the disease aorta, all the debris will have broken off, they all go out to, up to the brain, the pa your patient is going to go stroke out and they're all going to die. But is that really true? This is my, my, my uh, theater list from, last, from this Monday, uh, from this week on Monday. You walk into the theater on, uh, walk into the theater on Monday and you look at the list, Excuse the scribbling on my registrars, on my precious list. Uh, a, an AVR followed by coronary artery bypass graft. That's a really nice list. I, I shouldn't really complain about it, but is it? The first patient is an 81-year-old uh, lady, elective case, severe aortic stenosis. And if, when you look at the angiogram, you can see that there's a rim of cal there's calcification in the ascending aorta going to the arch of the aorta. And when you op when you open up the chest you'll find out there's a big plot of calcium in the ascending aorta going to the aortic arch. The question is, what do you do? In this case, you've got an 81-year-old lady on the table. So I decided just to climb across the aorta, and you can see that once it, there's a big plot of calcium going up to the clamp, so it's climbed right across it. I replaced the valve. The patient came off bypass. She was exhibited the, uh, the, the same evening, and she's probably on the way home today or tomorrow. The second patient on the list is an 80-year-old uh, presented with angina severe triple vessel disease. And you can see that on the ventriculogram, there's no hint, there's no sign that the aorta is diseased at all. But when you open up the chest, you find that there's a big plug of calcium from, on the ascending aorta going into the arch. I mean, that's the proximal extent of the calcium. And this is how wide the calcified plug is. So what I did was, I find the softest area Flow, pump, flow down and clamp it in the softest, the best part of the aorta, which is quite proximally, and then do all my graphs and put my top ends on uh, with a single cross clamp. And the mammary, the LAD is very, very diseased all throughout its length. It has to be grafted so distally that my mammary is not long enough, so I have to put it, do it as a free graft. So you can see that the top end of the graft is actually so proximal, it's actually at the, near the ST junction. How did that patient do? He, he woke up the, the same evening, extubated, and, uh, and, has, no, and has no neurological uh, deficit. This is the patient I did two, two weeks ago. A 70-year-old lady presented with shortness of breath and chest pain, history of double mastectomy and breast cancer, treated with followed by radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And you know what radiotherapy can do to the aorta. She's also been on long-term steroids. Rum she presented with a, a small infarct and angiogram shows severe triple vessel disease. An echocardiogram shows mild mitral regurgitation, and she, and she had an intra-aortic balloon pump. And I was so this case, uh, the patient is unstable, she took a chest pain despite being on the balloon pump, but the mitral valve is fine. You don't need to do the mitral valve, according to cardiologists. Just put a couple of graphs on, and that's all, that's all she needs. So I took her on, and if you look at the angiogram again, you do not see any calcification, no hint of any disease in the aorta at all. So she arrived in theater, the first thing my anesthetist do is do a TOE. And now she tells me that she got moderate to severe mitral regurgitation. Now the mitral valve also needs doing. So now she needs five graft plus mitral valve. And when we open the chest up, we find that ascending aorta is severely diseased. Now what do we do? Now you're faced with a 70-year-old, recent in, in MI, on steroids, with balloon pump, who needs graft, who needs mitral valve. And what are you going to do about the calcified ascending aorta? Anyway, you either do circulatory arrest, replace the aorta, <coughs> mitral valve graft, or you just cross clamp the aorta, do the graft and mitral valve and get out of here. So what I did was I cross clamped the aorta and did the, op did the operation. The balloon pump came out the next day. She woke up two days later and she's been discharged home. No, no problem. So I thought, I got away with all this. So I asked my registrar to quickly look through uh, my personal uh, data for the last two years and see how many of those patients I had unexpected intraoperative findings of calcified ascending aorta, and what do I do with it? And he found, I, I'm not able to show you the detailed data of all this because, the, of, because of the time constraint. But very quickly, he identified 12 patients. 
The average age ranged from 60 to 84, with a mean age of 74.3. I cross clamp all the, all the cases with single cross clamp technique. And surprisingly, there's no strokes, and they all survive. So really, do we really need to be very aggressive with treating these kind of patients? I don't know. Maybe I got lucky. Maybe the next case will probably stroke out and die. <laughs> so in conclusion, preoperative known or incidental intraoperative finding of a severely disease aorta is a significant challenge to the surgeon. There are many strategies available. You can either do it off-pump with arteriograph, or you can do a combination of off-pump with PCI, or you replace the aorta under circulatory arrest, or you just simply clamp it. I think it has to be assessed individually and the most appropriate uh, strategies chosen. Replacing the AO disease aorta under circulatory, uh, circulatory arrest is a fairly aggressive strategy. I think the simple close your eyes, cross clamp and prayer technique can sometimes be performed with quite acceptable results, surprisingly contrary to what you expect. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, all the speakers, for keeping to time. We've got now about approximately about 10, 15 minutes uh, before 13.45 when the shutters come down. <laughs> for those of you with lunch boxes, please put them in the bags at the back. I've been told to tell you that uh, before you go. So questions for this session, I'm sure if we don't have enough, uh, we'll have some for the coronary aspect of it as well. Please stand up and identify yourself by name. Hey, hey, yeah. No, 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 you sit, down. you sit down. You don't need to stand up. <laughs> yeah. um, just a comment about one of those American series you showed. Somebody's fixing their figures. They said they did 22 ascending aortic replacements with a mortality of 2.8%. Well, if one out of the 22 died, you must have a mortality of roughly 5%. Yes, yes. How can you have a mortality of 2.8%? <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Just a that. thought. Yes. <laughs> in, in. Helen LeGrand from the Heartland Link Center in Wolverhampton. Uh, James, I do the same technique as you do with a single cross clamp. You do the same. And uh, over the sort of last five years, I've probably had a good number, probably, I'm not, probably 10 to 12 patients who, where I thought, oh, there's a bit of calcium there, but I've done exactly what you did. Uh, close my eyes, clamp, and, and pray. And they've all gone home, and I think there's no problem with that. But the question is, if these patients were to stroke and did die, how do I defend myself? Well, the thing is that the alternative is to replace it under circulatory arrest, right? As you know, if you put them on circulatory arrest, there's also a risk of stroke from that procedures alone too. So you balance out the risk of clamping and giving a stroke from clamping, or you have a risk of stroke from circulatory arrest. I think both. I replace, I, I have, my, my special interest is in aortic surgery. I replace a lot of aorta, probably about 50 or so a year. And I replaced a lot of uh, disease aorta, but they're all aneurysmal aorta under circulatory arrest. So I do them. So they are risk with strokes too, doing both ways. I have no hesitation in replacing those aorta if I had to. But I just feel that you do get away with it more often than you think. Okay. Thank you for that. Thanks, James. Um, when you clamp a diseased aorta, do you change the cross clamp to use? Do you move across to one of the broader clamps, like a Crawford clamp? Or no, I don't. I still use the same. Uh, I still use the same clamp. The only difference is that I did what uh, Professor Westerby do. Uh, we turn the pump off, literally off, and then you can actually assess the area of the aorta, which is the most disease and which is the least disease, and you clamp it on the least disease area. And often you can find a, a spot where it's actually um, clampable. The only patient that I do not clamp is that on a rare occasion that when you get a really real porcelain, porcelain lead pipe aorta, and that you will have to replace. I don't think you can climb across those. Thank you for that, James. Aprem Yohana from St. <coughs> Morrison Hospital. Uh, have you ever tried, James, using the aortic cannula with balloon? No, I haven't. I, I've used it in 10 patients. It worked very well in nine. In one patient, it kept rupturing. I resorted to what you do as well. But in all the nine patients, the patient, uh, just like yours, went home without any neurological complications. Your 10th patient, when the balloon kept rupturing, implies to me that the, the calcium must be quite sharp and quite severe. Yes. Now, when you clamp it, did that, did that patient have a stroke? No, he didn't. There you are. 
I wonder if there's anyone who wants to stand up for off-pump surgery. I know you showed the coronary trial showing 1% off-pump uh, stroke rate, but I don't think there was any uh, rules in that trial to, to say you couldn't side bite. And I think a lot of those patients had sort of vein grafts, top ends. But uh, Paul Sargent's studies uh, and his series of complete no-touch techniques are about 0.3% uh, stroke rate. I don't know if anybody does complete no-touch here, if you wanted to mention, David. I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, presumably you think that must be a very valid technique in these patients uh, if it's just grafts? I think it's an accumulated series of uh, avoiding risk. It's a risk avoidance strategy. <coughs> Don't touch the aorta. If you're going to touch the aorta and clamp it, you put the flow down as Steve does as I do. I use a Fogarty clamp. All of, those, all of these cumulative strategies, you'll never actually know from any of the studies which one makes the contribution because there are so many variables involved in stroke. So I, that's what I do, and I use off-touch uh, technique uh, for, for that Y graphs all of the time. And the incidence of stroke in my coronary practice is zero. Mm. I mean, I, I would say definitely, if you do things off-pump and you're used, you base your revascularization strategy on two mammary arteries and then composite graphs from those, it gives you a true no-touch aortic technique. And in an 80-year-old with a tight calcified left main, this is a fantastic strategy. Open the chest, put on two, as I always say to Steve at our meetings, put on two mammaries off pump and leave anything else for the cardiologist to deal with for, you know, if, if something, if you have a moderate lesion in the right. So I think for coronary surgery, it's like, it really is a great technique once you're used to it. But obviously for, the, there are these times when you're doing aortic valve replacements and you've got, you find it difficult to get a place where you can safely put on your clamp, but you do the maneuvers, pump completely off and feel for the soft spot. Of course, what you can't be aware of are the soft friable things. You're, you're definitely not feeling those, but you do it and most of the time, for whatever reason, you get away with it. I, mean, I contributed over 90 patients to the coronary study as well, and I think it's been a bit of a disappointment and it hasn't shown big differences between on and off pump. But the key piece of information is that one of the speakers put up is that the more risk factors you have for stroke, then once you start sub-analyzing the groups of patients who then have strokes within that database, you'll find that those with higher risk, age, diabetes, da -da -da -da, two or more risk factors, you are going to get strokes, and they just get diluted into the, ma the main mass of the figures and gives you an overall picture that everything's the same. It's picking your cases, as you say, those high-risk cases, you can really benefit a particular individual patient. Questions? It's not for the chair to talk. <laughs> Steve. Yes, I'm just going to tell my colleague I had another talk at 2 o'clock and I was about to leave. Yes, okay. <laughs> well, do you want to present that? I think that was a... a I think that was a, a, a good and interesting session. Um, I, I concur with yourself that I think the, the only cases that you've got to be very, very careful with and not clamp at all uh, are the porcelain aortas. And it's inconceivable these days where every patient gets a pre-op x-ray that you don't spot a porcelain aorta bef before you get it to theatre. Okay, thank you. We'll pull that session together. One, one presentation to one of the speakers, Fabio. Uh, yes. On behalf of the Society of Cardiothoracic Surgery, we would like to present a, a small uh, gift to Professor Haverstad for his participation. See you shortly. I'll see you shortly. I'm in that section.